high throughput dispensing out these small droplets very precisely. Uh, we'll go into that a little bit more. Um, and also cleaning protocols such that you can use the same nozzle to handle multiple capture probes, whether they're oligos or antibodies or antigens onto a surface. And essentially there's no consumable part. It's just a glass capillary that we wash in between samples. Um, and so uh, that's, that's what this looks like. Uh, we can measure the droplet volume here. So these are around 474 picoliters with a 0.23% standard deviation. So it's just a very robust technology as long as a few requirements are met. The sample cannot uh, have any bubbles in it. Uh, those bubbles absorb that, uh, that acoustic wave that's generated by that piezo um, and it causes the droplets to fail. We have a number of ways to avoid uh, samples having air bubbles in them. Um, and then the viscosity has to be lower than about 10 centipoys, um, which is fine for all the all the work that we do. Um, and and yeah, so uh, but it allows us to essentially the glass capillary is around 60 microliters in volume. So you could aspirate up to about 60 microliters, about 55 microliters to be safe. And all of that glass capillary is something that we can wash uh, in a way that the carryover is, is negligible. Um, so, if, I think this is, uh, yeah. It, it, let's take a look. So, um, so we have this this camera that's focused on the the nozzle. And we can take and measure the opening of this orifice. It's around seventy three microns in diameter. We have nozzles ranging up to about 85 microns in diameter. Those are really nice for very large cells. We do some work with uh, Jenny Van Eyck's group in Cedars where they, we handle kind of 200 micron long cardiomyocyte. Um, it's a very gentle dispensing technology. There's no kind of, you know, kind of uh, high shear flow um, exposure. Essentially, you have this one, one droplet at a time. It comes out of the nozzle. There's this refractory period where we essentially take in air into the nozzle. It's about the same volume as that droplets. And then over time, capillary action refills the nozzle. We shoot off the next droplet. Any questions? We have a number of different coatings on the nozzle that uh, essentially avoid absorption of various biomolecules. Hold on a second. We're gonna we're gonna rewind. I was gonna ask for introduction. So that's a little bit about me and my robot. That's a little bit about me and my robot. I want to know about you guys and where you come from. So maybe we start here and kind of meander this way. Yeah. Sorry, English says, but you make that. That fancy meant was rather good fancy. Yep. Thank you. That's it. Awesome. Uh, on a page. Great. Just, we're we'll just turning up the volume on everybody this yeah, afternoon. Uh, just on the bottom days. Okay. Four. That's good. That's good. Awesome. But both the community and the other. But that, I'm pretty sure it's not able to look at it. Oh. Here, but also I work with malaria. Um, uh, I work with malaria. Uh, that we are all. I'm just hoping to learn more about it. But if I think, very cool. Where are you? Uh, just. Uh, uh, 
That's the I'm Kathleen. Um, I'm from Prevail Therapeutic. We're based in Manhattan, New York. Gene therapy company. Um, I am the buyer of the last biomarker tea. Uh, we have um, mostly best assay in house. I work primarily with biofluids, even plasma, DSF, some tissue, um, and that's very clear about people that was like that. Yes, I'm the first door tip with all cell lab in Copenhagen. I work actually with the other company, working with cell one. So, I'm uh, interested in seeing how you know, this book for your life. And um, in what's the name of this? Yeah, it is for the watch next scene and all that. Fantastic. Any other fine working mass can take a moment. I have to discover the past. Yeah, that's it. What's this? Great cool. Wow, quite a lot of a variety of, of people, a lot of mass spec, but also some kind of more single cell genomics, transcriptomics, interested in the proteomics. So we kind of got, you know, whether, um, yeah, going from kind of bulk proteomics to single cell or from single cell transcriptomics to single cell proteomics. So um, I think it'll be good stuff for everybody. And um, thanks everyone for your for your introductions. I will not remember all of your names. I apologize. I was like, I'll have a goal of trying to remember everyone's names and I just kind of dropped that halfway through. So... <laughs> <laughs> That's what name tags are for, exactly. All right, so. So, didn't learn. So yeah, so I've been working with I've been working with Nikolai's group um, for I think five or six years now. We kind of developed the NPOP protocol together. Kind of, I'm a my background is in chemical engineering, and so it's kind of small volume heat transfer, mass transfer, uh, surfer surface. Um, you know, chemistry, these things are things that I was familiar with coming in. Of course, Nikolai comes in with all of his understanding of mass spec and workflow development and whatnot. And so it was a really nice uh, kind of collaboration where we were able to automate a lot of this. And um, I don't know how many of you have seen kind of the original protocols that I know uh, that Andrew put together, a few of you. Um, essentially, we were just talking about it this morning and the the level of automation, and, and you'll get to see some of that today in terms of um, kind of just workflow integration it has been something that's really been, I think, very powerful for our early adopters of this to get up and running quickly. Andrew had years to figure it out, um, to do it right. Um, and so uh, we're really excited that we've been able to kind of document a lot of it and then automate as much of it as we can. And uh, we're, yeah, we're excited to show this stuff to you guys. So. Um, that's my background. And Lori, you introduced yourself. Change, but it's 
want to attempt in some set of things, but uh, it's still a lot of research and because essentially now we just have to stop the same tactic of the what take the more accessible ball. I think the master talk is acting on that talk with. It is very hard to get into. It's not something that you can just not stick in easy fit. Wait, you can't just put it in, or it's not a graphic on sheet. It's unfortunately something that's quite a lot of talk. And so the focus of this workshop is trying to make it that every one of you can do it. And try to make you far small to know. It, it's something that is uh, accessibility has been a little bit more difficult in this field of topic. And why it is. One available and more possible and think uh and we'll launch talking to other family uh by the talk. Yeah, absolutely. I think the most things the um it's a little bit for an instrument overview. Uh here on the left we have a a chilling water bath, heating chilling water bath, uh and a humidifier. Those things allow us to do essentially environmental controls and uh, long incubation with very small volumes with minimal evaporation condensation. Uh, we have two positions here on the on the deck. Um, and I don't know if you can see it when you're sitting down. And I don't think we have the video of the inside up. But uh, essentially, each of these positions can hold a, a 96 well plate, uh, a slide, um, the, the proteo chips for label free. Um, and essentially, the the programming is entirely flexible. Um, coming from that, the world of diagnostic manufacturing, clients would come to us with all different formats of diagnostic sensors, with uh, you know semiconductor integrated uh, fluorescence detection emission on you know little fifty micron pixels, uh, where we would have to put a, a drop of some capture probe. Um, but everyone kind of had their own format, so that forced us to make this super flexible interface. It also makes it a little bit complex, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this kind of like flexible, complex interfaces with the mass specs and other instruments. Um, but we've got groups who are doing, you know, single cell proteomics and also single cell transcriptomics genomics from the same sample, looking at this kind of correlative uh, information. And it's all enabled on, on the cell one because you can kind of program whatever you like. Uh, we have two cameras on here. One is this drop camera that allows us to monitor the the droplet performance measure the droplet volume and also image cells we have a four channel fluorescence imaging module on here that allows us to do stuff like dead cell stain which is really valuable when you're doing single cell proteomics not really interesting to you know analyze cells whose membranes have have become compromised because we see in our own research that you know these are typically uh lacking you know, some portion of their cytosolic proteins. And, and so you want um, complete cells. You can also do a lot of other kind of tagging or looking for GFT positive cells. So there's um, there's some ver various uses to that. You also get images of the cells with their uh, essentially, you know, parameters relating to their morphology. Um, and all of that allows you to do some, some more correlative analysis downstream. We've got... Uh, some syringe pumps in the back there, those are for allowing us to aspirate sample and also flush the nozzle out. This is a system liquid. It has to be particle-free, deionized, degassed. Uh, degassing allows us to absorb bubbles um, if there are bubbles present. Um, of course, particle-free, that 70 micron orifice, you know, trying to push a 100 micron piece of junk through there, you're gonna clog the nozzle. Um, a clogged nozzle is not, um, you know, it's not the end of the world. Most of the time you can unclog the nozzle, but it's something to avoid, especially on the day of uh, an important experiment. Uh, we have a peristaltic pump and you'll be able to see later, maybe we can do a little um, walk around, but you can just kind of see the, there's a wash station in here that allows us to watch each nozzle individually and kind of uh, remove all of the, the fluid that's in there. Um, the axis is an electromagnetic axis with a one micron encoder on it. Um, this comes from this kind of industrial manufacturing history of, of Sineon. It's a German, you know, uh, this German company. And so it's somewhat, you know, had this kind of like German engineering kind of, you know, thing to it. They don't, they spare no expense on the, on that hardware. Um, we have two nozzles mounted here. 
Uh, we have this this vertically mounted camera, which we use to do kind of QC of the process. So you can see that at the end of the day, all of these clusters got everything they, they needed, all of the reagents they needed in volume that were expected. Uh, but we'll show you more of that as we go. Uh, but we also have this deionizing probe on here, which allows us to do that kind of high resolution single cell printing into well plates that are notorious for having a lot of static electricity into very small volumes, you know, 200 nanoliters or so at the bottom of those wells. Um, and I think that's about it for here. We have a couple of different reagent reservoirs. This is uh, kind of specific to NPOT for the pickup part of the protocol. We'll show you, uh, we'll show you later. Um, and then we have a place for tubes, which we use for our reagent um, and cell dispensing. If you have really rare cells, you can certainly come out of a 384 well plate, little low dead volume, try to get all of, uh, you know, all or most of all of the cells. So, all right, with that, let's dispense some DMSO. We can close the window now. Uh, here. So we do have some interference from the light on the inside with our droplet imaging. So we're going to do some of this in the dark and we can turn the light on as we go. What's that? Got it. Got it already. Yep. Um, so the way that it, this looks is that we have this uh, essentially a step-by-step -step protocol. Essentially each step is um, in a numerical order. First we dispense the, the DMSO. We dispense cells into that DMSO. We then dispense digest into that DMSO cell droplets that incubates overnight. We come back in the morning, we dispense the labels, um, whichever labels you have, um, whether it's kind of the m track TMT or others. I know that there are others coming out and then you dispense either a, an activator or a quencher, depending on which of the protocols you're doing. Um, finally, you do a, this pickup protocol, which is where we pool each cluster into a single volume and move it to a 384 well plate that then gets dried down and put in the freezer for uh, for LCMS at the end of the day. So we'll start off with the DMSO run. Come over here, we load our field. So here we have all of these different uh, kind of plexity patterns, two flex, M track, and maybe you guys saw that yesterday in, in Jason's talk. Uh, where you use the third channel as kind of a carrier. Uh, Threeplex M track, which is where Plex DIA was, um, which is used in the Plex DIA papers. There's the 14 Plex TMT, which is that TMT Pro set with a couple of reference carrier and a, and a kind of a spacer. Um, and we also have, uh, we were lucky enough to get early access to a new version of the TMT labels that uh, where there are are more than just the, the current TMP Pro. I think any of you going to ASM Mass will learn more about this next week. So we're going to start off with this uh, this threeplex M track run, and we'll just select our DMSO fields. So this is essentially four slides worth of printing um, for the M track. That'd be about 1,500 cells that you could prepare in a single experiment. Um, because of the flexibility, if there are, if you would need to need more than that many cells in a single experiment, we could probably squeeze some more in. You'll see some spacing in the in the images. Today we're just going to do one slide's worth, and so I'll just remove the other slides. Hello. So for the M track, it's 384 per slide. And you can see kind of the spacing of these arrays right here. For the TMT 29 plex, where it's about a thousand per slide. So you can do about 4,000 cells in a, an experiment. Um, so it certainly offers you more scalability than you know some of the plate plate well preps. Um, and I imagine that as new labeling strategies come out, this can expand or contract depending on, um, you know, hopefully it will just be expanding. And maybe that you end up with, you know, 4,000 cells, but only, you know, 50 samples to run through the mass spec, which those 4,000 cells, if we were to ever get, I guess, 200 labels, um, which, you know, that, that may be a little bit, uh, 
a little bit far off, but uh, but yeah, that's the way this is currently set up. Um, and this will be, uh, you know, that divided by three is the the number of samples. Uh, each drop is going to get nine thousand picoliters, so nine nanoliters of the DMSO. So you go through. So what you do is you'll select. So yeah, we were just going to come in and start the run the day. So we we clean the nozzles, we refresh the system liquid. All that stuff takes about fifteen or twenty minutes. Then we will select the the run. We load our tar. We load our our target field file, which is that DMSO. We select the number of files we're going to do. Yes. Every time you talk. No, 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 those are those templates are already provided. Yep. Um, and we have uh, various templates if you want to do, for instance, like three cell types, right? Three cell samples. So those are already developed. If you had seven cell types that you wanted to run in, in one of these things, um, we're we're in the process of launching this NPOP partnership program because of the complexity of the of the process. Um, and in the interest of getting people to actually generate good data and not struggle trying to figure out technical details. Um, we see it as kind of a service contract. We provide you with all of the equipment, all of the, the hardware, consumables to do the, the end pop. And then we also consult and, and generate new field files for you based on your experiment as you, as you like, uh, because really it's more important to us that single cell proteomics continue to take off. We find biologically relevant, interesting things. Um, then it is that, uh, you know, that we, we just, um, kind of give you an instrument and say good luck. So, all right, so we're going to start our run. This is DMSO. I mean, my, I, I hate more than anything getting a call from, sorry, getting an email saying, yeah, we were having this struggle the other day when we were trying to do our experiment. We wasted all the cells. Like, why didn't you call me? Because like, typically it's like a five minute thing. And then you're back on track. And so I think, um, yeah, and that's, and that, you know, that's uh, maybe the way for a lot of things. There's not a whole lot that breaks down on this machine. Um, as long as you keep the system liquid nice and clean, then you don't have, end up with fogs. Um, so, so yeah, I think uh, it's, it's super sad. It's probably the most satisfying part of my job is jumping on that call, fixing that problem. And then they continue with the experiment and the next day, you know, there's an email. Thank you. Everything went well, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and sometimes you learn stuff through that. I mean, but it's a, but, but we do want to encourage the, that kind of interaction because I think the experiments are important and you learn stuff through the process of, of the troubleshooting together too. So we just finished the very first part of the prep, which is scanning of these fields. We just get these uh, images, these background images of the slide so that as we go through the process, if we see something that's abnormal, we can kind of trace it back to some event, some particle, some something. So these are just the, the slide image from above with our uh, coaxial camera. And now it says, confirm dispensability of bulk DMSO prior to continuing with the run. Consider wiping nozzle tip with ethanol. So chem wipe if excess DMSO remains or adjusting dispense parameters to obtain a single stable drop. So we press okay. We've already aspirated the DMSO. We have it here in nozzle three. We're gonna take a look at it. There's some DMSO on the outside of the nozzle here. We're gonna take a look and see if it is affecting our droplet generation. See a little bit of a kind of a wavering there. There is a conditioning period that kind of happens as DMSO replaces water at the interface. We might do a quick wipe. 
with our Kimlink, just to get rid of that DMSO. That is for the labels, you'll want to use an anhydrous DMSO for the labels, at least with the TMT especially. So, so now we've got a good drop. We press continue. It's going to do an auto drop detection, which gets us some information about the drop volume and the dispensing uh, stability. So after achieving a successful auto drop detection with both PDCs, perform a nozzle head camera wizard to align dispense. So that head camera that's going to do all of that imaging for us, it never sees the nozzle. So we have to essentially correlate the dispensing location, the both nozzles to each other. So we've got to put cells and droplets with the MSO. And we also want to have that camera know where our droplets are going so that we can uh, analyze them properly. So this next step is where we go to this nozzle head camera wizard. We'll move over to the slide. With nozzle one, we're going to dispense five drops onto the slide. We'll move over with the head camera. And we're going to click in the center of that drop. So this is the offset in microns from where I click the, the uh, essentially the offset in microns from the center of the head camera I'm image like to yeah. where that drop is. Yeah. So it was a one in the head camera. So everything then we're going to move back to target here. and do the same thing with nozzle three. Okay, there's our DMSO droplets. You can see it's a little bit different than the uh, the water droplet in terms of how it starts uh, absorbing kind of in, in the area around it, either DMSO or, or water. Um, and here's that offset. We say set. Okay, so now that we've got everything set up, we have stable droplets with DMSO. We've got our head camera and nozzles all coordinated. We press continue. It's going to wash out the DMSO, and then it's going to take a fresh aliquot to start doing its its uh, lysis buffer dispensing. So, and yep. So we have a we have a what we call our selling vial. It's just a very small volume, kind of low height uh, tube. It holds about two hundred microliters. We've loaded that with DMSO. Same will be true for the master mix. Same will be true for cells, as long as you have them in abundance. Um, and so that's what we aspirate out of, and then we're dispensing to the slide. Yep. Uh, Please, clubbing team. Second. No, cell suspension will be in PBS. We want to clean it up as much as you can to avoid background contamination with proteins and whatnot. Um, but the the DMSO is what we dispense onto the surface. It serves as two purposes. It uh, essentially kind of permeabilizes the membrane of the cells, starts that lysis process, and it also buffers evaporation condensation of of uh, fluid on the surface. So, question. So here we have our drop. The volume has been analyzed about three hundred and eighty-seven picoliters. And now you can see it over here. It's starting to dispense onto the surface. So when they're in the tube, um, yeah, so the, um, so I think the cells are sitting on ice over there. I wouldn't, uh, you know, we have in our in our protocols, try to prepare the cells like within one to two hours of the cell isolation step. Keeps the cells happy, you know, in general. Um, and it also avoids uh, a lot of kind of absorption of gas. So the colder an aqueous solution is, the more gas is absorbed inside of it. Um, they're solubilized inside of it. And then it's going to come back to room temperature in the nozzle or about room temperature in the nozzle. And that can cause off-gassing phenomena inside of the nozzle, where if there's some nucleation point, an air bubble will form, typically mostly oxygen, 
And then what we're going to do is um, that will cause the droplets to to be um, you know unstable. And so there, so I wouldn't suggest you know having them on on ice for hours. You can go through and kind of degas small volumes of these things under vacuum for you know five or ten minutes. Um, that typically will reduce the oxygen concentration enough that you don't experience that when it warms up. Um, and then the um, clumping is is a challenge for various cell types. Um, I think that not letting them sit is a is a big key to that. Um, we do have some resuspension protocols that the nozzle can do automatically, and we have customers in the kind of cloning space where they have you know a hundred different kind of edited cell lines they want to run in the day, and so the instrument can do this kind of resuspension on its own. Um, it's just whether or not you have kind of a, whether or not you really need that in your process. Most people just kind of pipe up their cells up and down right before they aspirate. So the cells need in the past few days, but if the cells that you need, they wash them. It's my, yep. That you wash them some more. Yep. What the density are they? Right. So kind of optimal concentration of cells when you're isolating is around 250 per microliter. Um, and that can give us, you know, about an hour to dispense 1500 cells. Um, if it's a lower concentration than that, it may take a little bit longer. If it's a significantly higher concentration of that, it may also take longer because you'll end up with more multiple cells in the ejection region. You'll see how we select whether or not we're going to isolate a drop with a cell in it. Um, and so, yeah, so that's the, that's the kind of, but I would rather be on the too low concentration side than on the too high concentration, but that's a good but that I just differ. It's the interesting that as far as taking this to take the ice part. So as far as the cell in one is concerned, there's not a big difference. I've seen that some of the fixation processes make the cells a little bit more transparent, it seems. Um, and so you may need different. Um, you may need different settings to detect them robustly, but, uh, but yeah, people use all sorts of different cells and, and uh, certainly fixation is something of interest. I have a couple of groups who are kind of investigating different fixations for single cell proteomics, um, just to kind of make processes easier, and allow access to more set type sample type. That's Say one more time. That's a great question that I would direct towards our mass spec core facility people. <laughs> what do we what do we think about fixation and, and mass spec? Yeah. Okay. So that yeah. All right, yeah, buddy. Yes. So, why uh, is working with self to it? Because I'm about to get started. Craft, so it's all out. Fresh is the best, right? everyone agrees um and so essentially the um yeah that that's going to be the best some sometimes it's impossible to get those you, you're getting frozen you know frozen cells we have some protocols for kind of uh gentle thawing um we also have some recommendations for how to freeze um cells to kind of avoid changing the you know avoid affecting the viability a lot it's uh, it Happy cells are happy scientists. 
so so yeah so selenion is offering this npop partnership program we're kind of in the early stages of it right now kind of finalizing all this documentation so yeah our goal is to uh release this to the customers of the partnership program to kind of accelerate the tech transfer so we have our before pictures we have our after pictures little funky, but um, essentially it shows you all the droplets. We have our slide is not quite straight here, but it's not going to affect our, our cell or anything dispensing. So you can just see kind of the reproducibility of these. And there was a step at the very beginning where we performed a, a QC analysis of where these droplets were. Uh, because of this evaporation or condensation or the condensation around the outside, we're having a it says essentially that the position of this dock is where the robot was trying to put the, the drop. And so that's where we're going to put the cell. That's where we're going to put all the other reagents. And so if we were to have any sort of issues with stability, we would see it here. And then you can decide either to, at this point, you could start over again. Maybe you aspirated a big particle and it made things really messy. You could wipe that slide clean, print just that slide again. Or maybe you say, oh, it's just one of these clusters. I'm going to avoid running those through my mass spec. Um, and so you can kind of continue like that. So in any case, this all looks like it passes our, our QCs. And so if you want to take a look here on the deck, we have our arrays. Again, that's 384 cells worth of lysis droplets. And I'll be ready for cells now. Oh, all right, all right. Yep. Hello? Yep. Night, not night, the night, the night, no, so he, they they did some customizing, like they had they had their own kind of bespoke solution for this this tray here, um, but this was one that I found from another project a long time ago, and I've kind of been integrating into the into this um, process. The slides were slides that we had had for a long time. We had a, kind of we did a lot of surface chemistry stuff, and I don't know that anyone had found a good use for them. And then it just so happened, Nikolai was like, oh, you know, what kind of surfaces do you have? We're looking for something very hydrophobic. Um, and this one ended up just fitting the bill. So, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. It's a floral carbon coated slide, so it's very hydrophobic. Um, yeah. And then the, the nozzles, of course, have a special coating on them. But other than that, everything else is pretty standard. Uh, standard for anyone who has a salad one. <laughs> yep. Why? From this here, yep, that's where we got the DMSO. We'll do that's for cleaning reagents, and then also for the acetonitrile water mix for pooling for essentially collecting all of the digested peptides that have been labeled into a single volume and putting them into a, a 3D flow up plate. Yeah, after stuff, pretty probably what's that? No, it's a it's a it's a it's machine, you nope. Yeah, Teflon is not 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 nice to 3D print or to to um or to mold. Okay, um, and then that lid on there keeps the acetonitrile from evaporating over the course of the run, so you're still at about 50 50 at the end, um, as opposed to you know what you might be if if you didn't have a lid on there. So, all right. So next we do our cell. So we'll take our DMSO out of here. We'll move it again for our labeling procedure. So this is one of the reasons why we have our two PMCs. We keep cells separate. Um, I don't know how, you know, Andrew, Andrew believes very importantly that Essentially, having the cells being in a different nozzle than everything else really makes the, the process more robust, and it certainly makes the pickup much more high throughput, right? Half the number of moves you have to do to, to essentially pick up to your plates. I guess the don't buy folks people when we change the wallpaper. I don't know how much customers can 
Yeah, so I don't find that I have to adjust very much for the DMSO. Um, Sometimes. Yeah, I think I think that it's... Um, yeah, I you know I've I've gotten so comfortable with just adjusting those values. I probably don't even notice that I'm doing it anymore. So, um, but and for some of them, we always change the target here. For some, like if you switch from like the library in like the budget blockers, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, then get the uh, yeah, yeah. So I think I see that. Yeah, it's PTC dependent. The Acida Nitrile certainly has a very different dispensing um, behavior. Uh, if you're working with something that's high viscosity, 50% uh, glycerol or some, you know, stock of some enzyme, um, that certainly needs a little bit more voltage to get a, a nice drop that's going to kind of persist. So now we've loaded our cells into our cell nozzle position. Okay. All right. So uh, again, we're going to now select the second run. We're going to load our fields. We have our three plaques M track. So again, here we have one and two cell types for the cell fields. We're just going to do one cell type here. Um, yeah, so I think we would just repeat it for the second cell type. If you really wanted to automate it, we could automate it more for you, but we find that people, you know, they're preparing their cells. They're going to set different, maybe isolation parameters for each cell type. So automating it doesn't really save you that much time. So this will be for all cells. Again, we select the number of slides we want to run. And we look in here. And we can see that we have our arrays. And every so often, we have a negative control in there. Those are true throughout the arrays so that you can go back and essentially really look and see if you have, um, you know, kind of sensitivity issues with the mass spec contamination um, in, in one of the channels or so. So there's the minimum. Depends on how big they are, how hydrophilic the surface is. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I would say you want to have, if you want to be, if you want to be robust and be able to do experiments, you know, without having to like super fine tune droplet dispensing and whatnot, you know, give yourself a couple hundred microns between drops. Um, there's any kind of, you know, surface heterogeneity, which typically with these slides there aren't, but the, the drops will essentially move to the most hydrophilic location. And so, you know, kind of, if you want to build in tolerances that allow you to have high throughput kind of ease of use, then you're going to want to essentially give yourself a little extra space. Uh, right now we have a 250 micron pitch in the X and we essentially have uh, four of those spaces. So these are about a millimeter apart, center to center of these drop, but they're also about 250 micron, 300 micron in diameter, especially once you have the trips in. And so you want to just account for that kind of how big that droplet is going to be. So, all right, so we have our, our slides selected. Uh, next, I'm going to go in and we're going to aspirate our cells. We're going to take cell and wash cells. Well, that's not that you guys have been getting real creative over here. Uh, let's see here. What is that mix and take task? I'm just going to, I'm just going to trust you or. I did. Oh, but that comes from the the well plates. Yep. You re you freshly suspended them though, yeah. But we're gonna go in and we're gonna take our cells. We can see that the nozzle is down in there. Our our tube there. We're taking ten microliters. We're gonna go back and dip. Essentially, we just want to wash off any residue that would be on the outside of the nozzle from kind of diving into the this, this cell suspension. So we do that. So we'll come to the camera. We'll open our cell in one module. So I've got I've got a group not too far away from here that does a 384 well plate with 14 different cell samples. And they just do cloning. It's an antibody production group so they know that you know if they do 20 total 
uh, wells, that they're going to get enough outgrowth with cells that are producing that antibody. So um, things like that have been automated to essentially go through many different cell samples. The same thing could be done here. It just hasn't, we haven't been, you know, it hasn't really been requested yet. Um, I think because people are still doing a lot of different kinds of experiments, maybe when somebody gets into a groove and it's like, I want to rush a hundred patients through this, you know, with these three different, you know, subsets of cells from their blood or something, then it would make sense to kind of, you know, automate that a little bit more. Not, not currently. Um, no, it is not. So we're going to set our, our region here and we'll take, yeah, absolutely. So I'm just turning on some drops here. So we see our, our, our cells flowing through and essentially what we'll do is we will do a mapping routine. Um, and this is essentially the this is the data that we use to identify where this ejection region is that gives us kind of this 99 plus percent single cells in in droplets and so you can see here the blue dots following each cell that's where the cell was detected in the last image and those blue dots will turn to green dots as soon as that cell isn't detected anymore and so after accumulating this i think we're doing 100 uh kind of particles worth of this tracking process we're essentially identifying which region here where the cells aren't seen again. Um, and we see that that's a pretty stark contrast here. We have some you know, small particles that we saw in there, but we see a pretty, uh, a pretty distinct line here between these green dots where the cell wasn't seen again and the blue dot where we were tracking it still. And so I'll just set this. I really want all of my droplets to contain a single cell. So I'm going to set it to the left of the last blue dot there. Tells us a little bit about uh, you know a histogram about the size of the cells, the elongation of the cells. We see really just kind of one population here, kind of um, sometimes depending on the sample, you can see multiple populations, and maybe you want to take uh, multiple populations. But we set that position and we'll close. Um, I don't believe these are stained. If they were stained, then we could use this uh, fluorescence. So we would first check. That there's a single cell and then we would check that it was negative for this fluorescent marker the dead cell stain um, but i don't believe that we have stained these cells and so we're not going to end up seeing uh, much of anything on this fluorescence oh maybe we did stain them I think that one was what was that um, Hmm? Yeah, so is the is the stain something you want to select for or against? Essentially, if you want to select for it, you'll set this check mark here and you'll make sure that these parameters uh, essentially gives you uh, in this isolation mode uh, cell that you're interested in that have a high enough fluorescence, a large enough fluorescence signal. Um, and for, for this one, we would say that we don't want to select cells that have this green color and so, so that is that. Um, and then we'll, we'll set here, essentially, now that we have this nice population of cells, we're seeing there there's a, a, some kind of clumps around here, and they're not all perfectly circular, but um, so we can essentially select this just kind of like you would on a, on a fax order. Um, essentially say, I want cells that are that size. And now as we dispense, you can see that cells that meet this criteria will have a green circle around them. Cells that don't will have a red. Oh. Now we'll turn on our standby mode, which is just going to essentially dispense out one droplet per second. Yep. So we, that's right. So essentially after this, we're going to essentially prepare for the single cell isolation step. It's going to pop up and say, you know, make sure you, you know, selected this, you've aspirated the cell sample, you've selected what you want to dispense. That's the right vehicle. 
So the dispenser is all is at the is at this camera station right now. Yep. So there's a we have a kind of a, a tube in there. It can be used as a recovery tube. You can fill it up with PBS. Every cell that we don't isolate, we dispense in there. You could recover that and you could send that to a different, uh, you know, you could make that kind of little small bulk sample if you have this kind of rare cells. And, um, or it's, I went to a cancer research center and uh, did a PMI a few years back. And there was just a kind of a brown pellet of stuff at the bottom of this tube. And I asked them, how often have you changed this tube? And they said, what tube? And so that was like, you know, hundreds of different xenographs and all different kind of cells. So, so yeah, so that's where they go. Um, yep. Yeah. So for instance, let's say you wanted a cell that was positive for a marker because you edited a cell and you want to know that you're knocking one in, right? Do you have a, a, a um, let's say a red RFP or something? And then you've got your Cytox screen because you don't want to isolate a, a single cell that's um, that's dead. What I would probably do in that circumstance is if the editing efficiency is somewhat low, I would start off with a fluorescence looking for a positive green or positive red, sorry, positive red. And then I would want a negative green and then I would want a true single cell condition in transmission. And I would make sure that only one cell was there in transmission, regardless of whether it was fluorescent or not. It was positive for the marker and negative for being topical. So, yeah, there's a number of different ways to set that up. And depending on kind of the, what the population is, it may make sense because it's all sequential. You're not getting all this imaging data at once. So if you did uh, for what we're doing here, where we're looking for negative in the grain, positive in the transmission, we'll look in transmission. It's how we find one that meets those criteria. And then we'll check our fluorescence. They will be true in fluorescence. If we're looking for something that's expressing this RFP, we're going to look for something that's expressing that RFP in that one channel, find one, then check the next condition, which is that it's not dead in the green channel, and then check the transmission condition. Yep. All right, so I've done my two things. I've selected my run. I've selected my, my fields for the cells, and I've got my cells in the tip of the nozzle here. So I'm going to start the run. Back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Got to make sure that the, the wheels are all tightened down there, otherwise they'll dance across the room. The cell in shuffle, like they call it. Yeah. It's just got a list of positions that it needs to fulfill with a single cell. And so there's no, um, and that list of position could be all of the position, right? Like it is here. If it's multiple cell types have been selected, then it's going to fulfill that partial list of positions for cell type one. It'll finish the run. And you'll then take the next cell sample, optimize it for which cell you want to, Take, then you'll press that second cell field file, which will be that separate yeah, document yeah. submission, so that you can end up having a different cell sample in the same uh, sets. In pain, your yeah, so it makes the flow all the time. So not not all the time. So it's it's a drop on demand technology. We squirt out a drop, we take an image. 
doesn't meet the criteria. If it does, we move over, we squirt out a drop. Bring it back. Does it create make the criteria? If it doesn't, we squirt, squirt, squirt. So gives you the time to get up. Yep. Yep. So unlike the flow site phenomenon that has to be kind of continuous with flowing, this is this drop on demand technology. So I would say this concentration is, you know, maybe twice as concentrated as I would like it to be. Um, so it'll take a little bit longer. Uh, and this novel is certainly dirtier than I'd like to be. Yeah. I'll be able to stop like uh, we did have my uh, but very that's right. Where there was a cell that met your isolation criteria, but the single cell criteria was not met due to either a cell, another particle imaged here, or another particle imaged in the sedimentation zone. So as far as I can tell, the, um, if during incubation you have a significant amount of condensation, that will negatively affect your kind of tryptonization of, of your proteins. Um, but most, and I mean, this will, this today is going to be a little bit funkier because we got the door going open and closed, right, to show people. But in general, we don't see a lot of this condensation or uh, evaporation. There's a, a setting in there that it depends a little bit on your exact setup, how effective the flow is through all the tubing um, to actually cool those those holders. But essentially, we we uh, measure temperature and humidity. We control the humidity. And then we also um, will uh, have this offset from the, the, the essentially the, the analyzed dew point to the temperature that we want on the deck. Um, and because the MSO is so hygroscopic and ever very, I mean, it, it freezes at like 18 degrees, right? Um, of course, if you've ever, you ever look at a DMSO water, like freezing charts, yep. Like if you look at what the freezing point of DMSO is, it's like 18 degrees, freezing point of water is zero degrees, right? The mixture of them goes down to like negative infinity though, right? Zero Kelvin or something like it. It's a, it's a pretty crazy uh, chart when you mix DMSO and water. It's a very uh, interesting kind of interaction. That's what that is. I yeah, yeah. So as as you increase the concentration of either DMSO to water or water DMSO, it just kind of falls off. And I'm uh, yes, it's a chart. Yeah, somewhere. I mean, it's really it's quite a broad range. I was really surprised when I when I first saw it. Um, you know, hydrogen bonding. I don't know. It's um, but it's it's a pretty wild mixture. And what it does is. Um, it just really allows us to let's see here. No idea, but so water. The... Which is, I think, why we do our our cryopreservation, right? It doesn't actually become. Right, I mean, so they they don't actually connect these lines anywhere, right? So you have your freezing point of pure DMSO there, freezing point of water there. I don't know what that is, but yeah, but yeah, it's um, yeah, one of those interesting properties of I don't know water or DMSO, but but essentially it allows us to we we really don't see a whole lot of effects of. Uh, slight evaporation and condensation as long as the droplets don't merge. Uh, if the droplets dry out completely, you see a, a kind of a small loss in the, the number of like you know peptides identified. But even that's not a not a, doesn't seem to be a big deal. And you'll have records of all that anyway. So mm -hmm. Yeah, no, so that's that's a good question. So right now we've done 150 cells and uh, the concentration is still about what it was at the beginning. Uh, maybe we had a little bit of sedimentation at the beginning with all the kind of pausing, so they kind of with a little bit of higher concentration there at the beginning. 
but you'll see that the concentration will start to go down over time. Um, I guess our fluorescence measurements aren't working very well right now with the door open. Um, but, but essentially the, um, I would say 10, 10 microliters, uh, aspirated at 250 micro cells per microliter is probably going to get you, I would say something like 500 cells, 600 cells before the concentration starts to drop off. Um, and so you might do a couple of aspirations. Um, uh, no. That that is a software request that's in the books there. Um, so, yeah. If you wanted to isolate fifteen hundred cells without having to re-aspirate, aspirate more volume, aspirate twenty five microliters, and then you'll be good to go. I wanted to say on the business. Great question. Um, so with the standard cell in one software, I would say we do nuclei um, just fine. As you get towards bacteria, if you have them labeled uh, with a bright chlorophore or something, you can do the bacteria with the standard cell in one. We have a micro life software that allows us to do uh, bacteria both in bright field and fluorescence got to be coli um and then we've also done single organelles other than nuclei um and so you can imagine kind of what what those might be um so, so yeah if we get if we can detect it then we can isolate so i would say the micro life version would be the way to do for that one yeah so there's a there is a tracking of the See if this. I'm going to get rid of the fluorescence for now. Um, there's so we essentially when we well, when the nozzle comes back from the the deck, we take an image, we identify where the nozzle is in that image, and then we look in that position relative to where that nozzle is to, to essentially look inside of the nozzle again and see the cells. And so you do see a slight shaking or, a, you know, these kind of spots new that are on the, on the camera. Um, <laughs> under the current circumstances, it, it may lead to some false uh, negatives, right? Where a cell does it, where it thinks there's a particle in the background where there isn't. Um, we should definitely try to clean up this nozzle. And I think that we have a new camera that we need to upgrade to that has the, that doesn't have some spots. Um, so I don't know that that's going to get rid of the, the thing, even if you had it bolted to the wall. Um, because I think a little bit is that the axis is still kind of like coming to um, coming to a stop, um, but certainly the the flatter and more sturdy your floor is, the better your your situation is going to be. I've got one in my house, so when I when COVID hit, I had one in the back of my car. Um, it's not it's a two part system. It's like seven years old. I towed it behind an RV in the back of my car. From Vancouver, British Columbia to San Diego and back probably four times over the course of a couple of years, doing demos, doing um, training, service, trade shows. Um, and I have that in my in my basement on a one of these gurney, one of these gurneys for getting in and out of the car. And I run in all the time and the whole thing is shaken and whatnot. And so I think, you know. Based on the the axis being bolted down to you know all of the aluminum and whatnot, I don't see I don't see a whole lot of disturbances from some shaking. Uh, which the uh, like when 
Yep. Just a software, just a software. Module. Yeah, there's two software modules. One is for the actual isolation, uh, detection and isolation, and the other one is for analyzing those images. So, um, Ryan Kelly, they did one last year where they did the, the I, they had a poster for bacteria, single bacteria proteomics. I think they were getting a few hundred proteins per cell uh, for bacteria. Um, and then there are a number of other groups who are doing similar things um, that haven't shared yet. But yeah, so the, um, so there's a, so I've got, I had a collaboration with TNNL where they, they developed the nanopop, right? And I would say like three years ago, we decided we wanted to do this multi-omics from the same single cell. No. And so, um, the gentleman there, you can see who I get. You know, there, there are a lot of really great people in, in this space. Um, he's certainly one of them. And so we developed the, this nano splits uh, process, which um, will get published sometime soon. Some really interesting data there. Not that there's a great correlation between RNA and protein. There's no clear. Sorry to spoil it. Uh, I, I think we all kind of guessed, I guess. But um, And then we also developed, and we're working on the manuscript for a, a kind of a high throughput version of that. Um, where we essentially, we kind of bind the the cell to one of the nanopot slides, we permeabilize it, and then we remove this volume of permeabilization fluid into a microfluidic uh, chip that does a single cell RNAC. And so in that one, we've, you know, we're recovering nearly all of that liquid phase onto the, onto the RNA sequencing chip. The cell stays behind. We then digest and do everything on the, on the cells as they were um because the world changed um there's no clear path to kind of commercialization of these things and the finishing of the development of this whole process unfortunately um one of the kind of the big sadnesses of my of my life to like kind of pour most so much time and effort and, and make all these relationships and then you know have the situation kind of come up that oh you know we have to kind of stop these projects um just because you know it's it's uh but with the diagnostics part of our business we grew like crazy during covid right um we installed i was down in san diego in my rv in this parking lot installing this five portal s100 system each each portal had 10 nozzles it was 50 nozzles they run them 24 hours a day six days a week installed that first line they then bought two more. They now bought two more than that. So now they have 250 nozzles running 24 hours a day, six days a week. Um, I trained three ships of people. It was after me insane, right? Um, and so we had to build up our company to meet all of these demands for all these different COVID diagnostics manufacturers. And then COVID's not really a big deal anymore, right? So we don't need more of these machines. We still have all these people. And so it was just a hard time. Uh, to kind of come out of this huge ramp up of our business um, to find that the market really didn't need nearly as much anymore. And so there have been some, some you know, collateral damage to that kind of situation. Uh, nine nanometers. Yeah, it's around 300 picoliter. So every time we measure the volume, if we have a volumetric dispense of nine nanoliters, 13 nanoliters for the trips, and what we do is we um, we take whatever the, the most recent detected drop volume is, divide the volume that is dedicated to that position by the drop volume, and we calculate the number of droplets that we need to dispense there. I think, yeah, Around 300 picoliters. Uh, we have 
smaller nozzles, which are good for smaller particles. I'd say if we're going to do nuclei, it's a little bit more deterministic of the small nuclei, certainly of bacteria or viral particles. You want to run with a smaller nozzle. That'll run around 150 or 200 picoliters. Um, and then for the large nozzles for doing kind of cardiomyocytes, astrocytes, these kind of large particles, you're going to run around 500 or so picoliters. I'll think it why those to claim it. No, yeah, so these pig dots were all particles that were detected that did not meet our isolation criteria, but were within our detection criteria. The green dots are cells that were isolated because they met the isolation criteria and the single cell criteria was met. The yellow dots are all cells that met the isolation criteria, but the single cell condition was not. And so... Uh, that's essentially due to too high a concentration. Yep, only green goes on the slide. Okay. Yep. What other that side then we go? Um so I would say that they're probably like six microns in diameter. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the bad, what is the better thing you said? So if you're handling a smaller particle, essentially you have uh, very small particles. There's a, It's a pretty low laminar flow in the tip of the nozzle, but there are kind of locations where small particles can kind of get stuck in little vortices and they don't flow as uniformly. And so if you have a very large, uh, a large nozzle or a medium nozzle, Instead of being kind of 95 plus percent single bacteria, for instance, you'll be 80, 85 percent single bacteria, and those other wells will beat them to you. Maybe you, because of the the diameter, also increasing the kind of focal plane where you need to be able to detect stuff. So you're bringing everything closer to that focal plane, and you're essentially creating a more uh, robust kind of laminar flow, which gives you the ability to do that. Um, and then the larger size nozzles are better for Samples with larger cells and um, aggregates. Um, so, all right. Uh, now it's scanning with the camera. Yep. Take it out the air. Apple health just is so bulky. Yep. Yep. Mainly for our diagnostics. Sure. You can only have as many nozzles really as you have uh, syringe pump. Uh, yeah. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right, so these are our after drops. So one thing that we've incorporated recently is these are these fingerprint drops, which are essentially every single one of these positions gets every reagent, except for its label. It only gets one of the labels, right? And so um, it's easy to see when you add the trips in, for instance, you see the droplet get bigger. But what we've done is we've kind of spread out the cells uh, or spread out all of the reagents here at the bottom of the slide in a way that, so here's the DMSO droplets. Here's the cell droplets. We'll get a trypsin droplet next. If you have multiple cells, you'll see multiple cell droplets. And this allows you to, so if, let's say you thought you made up trypsin, but you didn't. So we have a, I had a group who had a, a bottle of, of um, formic acid wrapped with uh, aluminum foil right next to their DMSO bottle wrapped in aluminum foil. And so they di they dissolved their, their labels in this formic acid. And we went and dispensed them and they dried out really quick. And it was like, what, well, you know, what's, what's this about? And it's, uh, and so we were able to see this is clearly not DMSO, right? Um, and so being able to kind of space out those reagents. Also, if you don't have like, Sure, the trypsin spot will dry down differently than uh, just a buffer spot, just because of the excess material in there. And so, essentially, we see that, um, and you can see the single cell in here. Another one over here. So it isn't as dry yet, so it's a little harder to see. You can see the cell there. But essentially, we have QC that says every set. We do not see any droplets outside of the reaction droplet, right? And that's because all of the cells made it into those volumes. So we have this confirmation um, that we can kind of go through and just make sure that that's the case. 
It's not always the case, but as long as you really take care to clean the nozzle and make sure you have good stable dispensing, make sure you're not off gassing, you're going to get this kind of behavior. So, that's the best in the process in the market. So, so you can look at, oops, if I can just click on the right stuff. So, every so this is a background image, I believe. So every cell, oh, of course, we're opening in paint. That's fun. Right. So you get images of all of your cells here, both fluorescent and non fluorescent. You can see some of these are some pretty junky cells, but so you would be able to go through here. Okay. And essentially correlates uh, back, and essentially QC yourself, um, what these are. Um, and, and Andrew will show you later, uh, you've got some some stuff where in his analysis package, you essentially look at correlating diameters to cells. You can see cells that are sitting outside of this kind of normal range. Um, and it seems pretty clear that something's weird there. Um, so... These are not the happiest cells, but uh, or the cleanest nozzle. So this one looks like it had two. Good. So yeah. So you have this record. Um, you could you could also you could record all of the images. You could record all of the uh, the images with cells that were detected. Um, there's a, a number of different kind of files here that that can output. Um, data let's see so this is all of the these are all the isolated cells this is just the kind of global properties of all the cells that were detected so a lot of a lot of ways to analyze this data so it says isolation repeated if you're done isolate uh, dispensing cells make sure to close the cell monitor before continuing the preparation and just like Laura said at the beginning, you need to have the cell monitor open to do the single cell isolation. You also have to have it closed to do the uh, the rest of it. Um, one thing you could do is if you want to like have consistency from run to run in terms of these properties, you can save all of these properties as for you know a certain cell type or a certain experimental you know condition, so that you're selecting the same population of cells from run to run. Uh, based on morphology. So with that, I'll do a quick wash. So what time is it? It's 11 o'clock? Yeah, we want to take a... So this is a good uh, time for the break, is what we're saying, yeah? Which is the same group. Yes, because next next thing we're going to do is we're going to do the labeling. We're going to show you how we do the labeling. And then after that, we're going to do the pickup. So any other questions before we break? Okay, let's all get some exercise and a little bio break. So close this up. Yeah, please skip that hole. I'm always thinking about like, you know, to work with uh, like tissue uh, single cell suspension where you have like multiple different types of cells yep. and different types of cells that will be different in size of that yep. shape. And, and I, I, I mean, I could see that how your uh, quad is connected to the left area uh, and want to like come down. But I would, well, in my perspective, I would give more interest in young. Oh, uh, everybody yeah. was so mm -hmm. because I I, I don't well, not as full the top of the cells so that we can do out. There you have some some type of blood so cells and not all the tools. I can can I just the focus at it and yeah. and on the consoles which work on the on the bottom of the slide. Mm -hmm. So it will have for each area it will have a really single cell droplet. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And that's really, um, it's really helpful with the, with the reagents. I think it's also nice to see the cells in alignment yeah. with each other. Um, 
But yeah, for, for a primary sample where you have a lot of heterogeneity, which is why we're doing these studies anyway, um, you can either say, you know, identify what population you have in terms of size. Maybe you don't know what kind of cells they are, but you know that I've got big ones and, and medium ones and small ones. And maybe you want to, you know, if they're evenly, you know, it's kind of, you know, 25% one and another and then 50% the rest, then maybe you just isolate this broad spectrum and then go back at the end and like, uh, you know, based on your analysis, kind of correlate back to what these, what these things are. Or you could say, I'm going to take the sample, I'm going to isolate only the small ones for cell type one, but I set my conditions, so I'm only isolating small ones. And then I go back and I say, okay, cell type two, I'm going to isolate the medium-sized ones. And then you'll get a, a mixture in each of your sets. But it's going to be, in the slides, it's going to be type one. Type no, 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 they'll, they'll be mixed in each, each. So, and this is totally flexible, right? Um, but yeah, in, in each of the plexities, yeah. you're going to have whatever you define in those. So it could be cell type 1, cell type T, cell type 3. And you're just defining those all based on their friend. And it's all it's totally flexible in terms of um, how, to, how to organize that. We had a group ask for uh, randomization of TMT labels in a, in a different prep the other day. It was something that was really easy to do because um, you want, you know, you watched some variability in, in, in the confirming that there aren't just bad things with your labeling you know and that so um so yeah but yeah i think you know that's that's the right way we got to be thinking right and if you want that to you just image just when you take that one every time you take the or drop it into the to let each the uh, slot yep i think so each well so that image i can correlate with the book which well it makes sure yep yeah, yep. and basically if there is some doublet or something like that, I think it, yeah, I should not actually proceed with this thing. I mean, it it I think it all depends. I mean, if if at the end of the day and you're doing something like TMT or there's some hype, if it's just three plex, maybe you don't waste your mass spec time on it, right? You say I just don't I'm not gonna include this in my auto sampling list. Um if it's you know your you know, twenty nine flex TMT set, then maybe you allow those doublets and you just kind of filter them out of your data at the end. Right? So in Andrew, in your second session, you'll learn a lot more from Andrew about how he kind of correlates that data to to the mass spec data. So, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Great questions. So glad we're all interacting so much. It's awesome. Yeah. Please. Um, uh, the that's what I think you also love mm -hmm. are uh, the parasites which are within the blood cell. Uh, so, the parasites within the blood cell. Uh, so within the army. So I would be in the speed of transmission because we like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but similar to the kid, they are at different stages. And if I have to separate this out, uh, would it be possible if I, or if I, uh, do I need to have a tag, or a tag on different states to be able to separate them? Because essentially they're all the same uh, outside because they're out. Mm -hmm. But within that is when the separation happens. What, what percentage of cells are one way versus the other? Are infected and not infected? Or... So, uh, there would be infected and uninfected, but within the infected ones, mm -hmm. there is huge range. So there are uh, essentially categorizing three stages, uh, which is one is a ring stage, which is very tiny. Then a tropical stage, which is like slightly in the middle, and the uh, last trisome stage which is pretty big almost equivalent to the oxygen oh, wow. um so we'll look at, um, what is this again malaria yeah wow plasmodium. okay plasmodium that's better. so what i'm interested in is studying the profiles of these different single cells at different stages so okay is there a way that we can annotate at this level or isolate at this level cells that have these different stages of the growth of them yes. I don't want to see it. I just want to see them in the in the nozzle, right? Um, you know, it's possible if they do absorb more light that maybe you have like darker particles. And you can... one thing that we differentiate, which I think in the first episode, that's my second question that I had, which is basically uh, uh, the the degraded product from hemoglobin that the parasite takes and goes to the mm. So the the amount of hemoglobin that still actually increases with the different stages. So at the stage of five one, it's nice the moment that bring stage is the deep. That is basically what you will be able to see it in the transition. Mm. So if there is no demogoin crystal that we 
Mm. Uh, but if it's a small degree, it just goes away. And and these are not autofluorescent at all. Or no. okay. But we can make them fluorescent. That's a that's another thing. I mean, I think that's your best bet. Okay. Um, but I, I, it's possible that just based on the transmission, you know, if there is, if it does interact with the light differently, that we can look at the kind of intensity of that of that difference between the background and the foreground. Um, we've done work with kind of, uh, what do they call, they're like, um, they're like gel beads that have a cell inside of them or not, right? And you isolate this gel bead with the cell. You don't want the gel beads without the cells. You don't want the cells without the gel beads. And so we set up a way to, to do that. Um, we isolate only the elongated cardiomyocytes. So we say, okay, we want, essentially want only things that have an elongation factor greater than four. And we take, and all of the ones that are kind of damaged, they hyper contract. And so we don't take these kind of round ones. So there are a few different ways that we can we can play with that. It may be that there would be some kind of custom software uh, thing that we would do, but it really depends on what those images look like, right? Okay. And is there a way that with our eyes we can differentiate these different states in transmission? Um, certainly in fluorescence, we would probably yeah, do. Yeah, what I will expect is that one of the worst talents that I would do um, it too much is so we see that the position of which of these spots, like which of these labels is different in each cluster, which allows us to then vary which of the cell samples are getting which label. So you have a nice bit of variety there to avoid like kind of label specific effects. We got it in G1, 2, and 3. <laughs> That's right. So we'll close the door up here. We can do all of our imaging. We can get a very nice drop. So we go and select our labels. We just imagine that we already dispensed the trips in and we all went to sleep. We came back in the morning. We already loaded our labels field file, selected our one slide, closed our cell in one module. Uh, we also want our DMSO conditioning buffer here. This is our cells. It's left over of our cells. We got my DMSO right here from earlier. Oh, yeah, so you would, you would aspirate it just as though, so essentially it's the same protocol as the DMSO dispense, um, where you aspirate the trips in from, from this position here. If you have just two slides, or actually for, for the Plex DIA, one aspiration of 35 microliters is enough to dispense to all the positions. You're only doing 13 and a half nanoliters of the trips in. For the TMT, it's two aspirations, one for the first two slides, the second one for the second two slides, just because it's more volume. Yeah more spots um and so yeah so the trips in is essentially kind of a repeat of the dmso with some slightly different um slightly different stem but just very slightly the way you just dispense it you shoot it out so those droplets are traveling at around two and a half meters per second and so we're and it would generate the pretty good mixing um inside of the the well as well or in that that drop as well so, there are certain kinds of substrates where we just need to kind of drop that's really black and off of the volume. But again, because of the uh, this full QC where we need a jersey, you just need to any kind of things like that. And sometimes you'll have a, a piece of you're not able to totally check the droplet before it goes into dispenses. You can manually check the droplet any time during the dispense. So we're just going to make it go and upload it as we go. 
So it says please input the make sure that the plate is in there. It's your last chance to make sure that there's no seal on it, that it's in there in the appropriate location. You index in the front left, right? Yes, the A1 is the front. And you told the plate to the front left? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's gonna go and scan everything. So there, there are times where you'll aspirate a big, a big piece of air or something, um, and the, the droplets will end up being disturbed by this air that's like not hanging out of the orifice. The droplets are going, um, and so it'll come back at the end of the dispensing to get an image, and you'll see this big air hanging out, and the droplets are all up. So you can go back and you can review the images that you took from before and now you can identify at what point things started to get funky. Um, as far as uh, as far as is concerned, if you get like half, you know, if the dispensing starts to get funky and trips in and just wasn't fully added, just go back and re-dispense to those positions more trips in. It's not really going to cause, you know, a failure of the trips in patients that we have to get to this technique. And so it all really depends on what you see. But again, kind of keeping the samples clean, keeping the um, just the liquid, the particles, all this stuff, and more in the species. The 150 microliters of beer itself. So you might even like centrifuge down these tubes after you pipe them full to make sure there's no bubble at the bottom, to make sure the particles are all the way at the bottom. All right, so we just did our imaging. After a short break incubation, so we'll go back here to our images. Do this details, labels. Right. So you see here all of our drops. How they were again at the beginning of this card. So we just took up some bulk BMSO, and the water has been sitting in that nozzle ever since we washed it out for the BMSO. Um, so we want to make sure that the BMSO is nicely conditioned by the nozzle, and we have a good drop with it. Let's say that that's um, and typically if you have a large volume of fluid here. If it's being disturbed at all by the, the, the droplet that's coming out, then you're going to want to wipe it off. And you're probably going to clean the nozzle a little bit just to make sure that it's uh, not going to disturb the space. But it looks like this droplet that's on the face of the nozzle isn't actually near the work. It's, it's not being affected by the droplet generation. So um, I like what I see. Let's continue. It's going to do an audit down protection on that. And then essentially it's going to walk out of that sample and then it's going to go and start taking the labels. One at a time, bring the camera, check the drop. Uh, so the field file has essentially, uh, so there's, there's four layers of um, dispense targeting that are this kind of hierarchical thing. So you have, you have a module, which is a, an array of spot areas. Each spot area can have an array of fields. Each field has an array of spots. And so uh, essentially, if the field file contains the spacing for the spots, how many spots there are, the spacing from field to field, um, and then what volume is dedicated to the position in that, in that, in that spot of that field and what level of function. So all that information is in that field file that then provides. And then essentially you just select how many of the parts you want. Uh, which for this, because we have just one big spot area, we kind of remove the couple of those data and keep it up. And so that one I just picked up um, from G1, and that is the first layer. So this is. Um, Reflex that uh, could be M track, could be uh, delta zero. So, picking up from that first position, um, even with the two nozzles, and remember, only one nozzle is currently working, and that is currently the third nozzle. Or the, I mean, third position and second nozzle. Okay, so you can see here, 
It's simply going down the road, but going down the columns and dispensing only one of the positions of each of each yeah. cluster. And if you guys want to take a look at it too in the back, uh, uh, only using one box as well. But you could just go Yeah, and whenever the complexity gets higher, maybe there will be some some interesting using both. How many nonsense? Oh, yeah, we'll do manually, which we've already done. Two, there's two yeah. strings, probably. Because yeah. 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 the interaction manually, right? When you start with multiply, it's not like two, you have to say, okay, that's even one. Exactly. Exactly. Well, it's going to wash, and then it's going to be Well, actually, that's going to be um, no, no, it doesn't actually. It doesn't it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't oh, you have like the position three, three and the historical part of that. That is what you need to work to be doing. So, you might like the most important kind of thing. Because if you're the longest, you can see that I'm now of the sample of the inspiration of the next thing. That's very good. That's what they know about it. That's what you have to do. So again, the three eighty four well plate will have flex the other day with one nozzle. So, so everything so we'll we have to do some reteaching for this 384 well yeah. Yeah. and it's already there and also it's um it's really nice that you have like a 29 flex that we're currently doing and if you're as we develop higher flex and hopefully if we get to do 109 flex whenever i want we want you to do that that's why that's my problem you know what i'm saying but that spelling is being affected by my and I made drops. Yeah, oh. And so what I'm going to do. And this helps. Um, and then going to. Once we. Um, do this. And, and, it, and it just keeps on. We're going to do this PDC manual cleaning step. Oh, uh, yes. Oh. Uh, you don't know. So we're going to launch this sample out. Because we don't like having these beds. You can return a certain volume of it to the well plate if you want it to. This is just MSO, or so that then puts it in for some of that. Then I'll get myself a pin white. Right there. I don't have to all in this wash tray right now, just for this purpose. Uh, but the wash tray is made of Teflon and some super compatible with wash tray. It's 3D printed too, right? No, it's, it's machine. Um, um, so it says low like 2 mil volume, the lungs at the retinol, it's your wash tray that's been seated. Okay. okay. It's going to go in, it's going to take up 30 microliters. Um, Good I mean, um, we have reached to society and the process all of them still. All right, so now it's going to take a very camera line, my position to and essentially we're going to flush it out and have a little microliter per second of the septal. Take our kim weight here. And I'm just going to scrub the base of the nozzle of the ethanol. If you're going to heat this on an unimpotent glass nozzle, it would become extremely hard to fill it when you get it super clean. And that would be a problem. But because these are coated nozzles, Essentially, what you end up exposing is that coating again. It has that kind of um, blood characterized hydro obesity. 
Yeah, that's done. Press OK. It's going to wash it out. We'll go check our droplet again. We're going to take that sample again. Which is been saved. We also use the JSO to generate a kind of an ultrasonication inside of the nozzle. When we're in the question, it helps to clean it out. Check the droplets of the two nozzles. We're going to go and take up well, G2, take up 10 micrometers. Okay. You already you loaded 30 micrometers in those wells? I loaded 20. Do you usually load 20? Do you take up 30? No, I was taking up 10. Oh, 10 is fine. But but I already took it. So, else. Let's see. What we shall see. We have here this large air bottle. Yeah, I mean, don't do that, guys. So, we're going to select that. We're going to flush out two microliters at a time and see how much it actually took. Looks like we took about three microliters of air. Uh, so, depending on how you have it set up, so now I have an air stop again. We can just go and ride this excess beer that's built off outside the door result. So, if this auto droplet detection were to fail, because the droplets, there were two droplets, and the droplet is outside of this region of interest, then you would open up the nozzle setup window, in which case, you need that one. Um, set it up to essentially skip closed. So, uh, in certain kind of production environments, you have these things running overnight. And so, instead of like, being like, hey, user, come and fix this, we just skips that flow, washes out, maybe there's some revenue, you know, air, air level, um, and then we'll move on to the next sample and dispense that. And then at the very end, It'll give you a list of all the samples that failed those free auto drops, which then allows you to generate a field file just based on those and rerun all of those samples. Now you can see that two of the drops are bigger than the third. Um, one of these alternating, alternating range. We get our last volume of detection. Now the field continues. A little bit of a pickup. Can we have a 50 50 piece of bread on water? Make sure that it's a little bit of a pop into the Yeah, we'll make it fresh. Thank you, that's a good idea. So I'll make it fresh. Cool. Just long term Cashmere's, optics, robotic. So um, we change out all the tubing every year as part of the field uh, Just to make sure nothing's growing in there. Nothing's falling in water and so that would be wrong. 
There's uh, there was a relay that used to go on um, with a mechanical relay between switching between the two energy modes. You swap that out for a song so you can use that. And so um, that is that you can go all the way break it off. Right. 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 You know, especially when people are doing stuff with new things, teaching new plays, they can get it you know, both with two sides and they can pop it down, they'll make the draws go. Well, once you have everything kind of set up, so that model of the box, you would say that you have very lucky to tell the water is clean up. Um, it's pretty hard to get out of the day. You probably bought it off of 70 or something. We do see next year have a service time for that. And then it was one more kid switch. So they would be the switch. It's an international piece of equipment of bed. I guess I mean, I feel the total one up and down the West Coast on I 5. In the back of a four door station, I like, go behind my RV by six thousand, but ten thousand miles, and I have one, one piece that's on a very plus trip. It looks like a digital output one of the slots, and the digital output card failed, we swapped it out, and now I have a problem with it. And then the last slide, it'll be kind of fun. And then we're up there. So we're all going to do this. I see. So we're just saying, I'm Strong against the one soul. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, again, you know, if, if you break it down, it's only using the place of the other things. You should be able to take it off. The zones relays that I'm talking about, I'm kind of a yeah. one yeah. pager, and I'll take people through with a video call in 30 minutes and talk about those relays. Uh, there is a 14 day run. Every 14 days, you do this one. Uh, and let's take the first day for I. We said we use flush ethanol, inhibitors of the air, water. Through those liquid lines, essentially trying to get in the health nodes that are warming out. Or, depending on the sign again, we have an HA, our. Yeah. The instruments are pretty soft, but we've managed to take it up to 70 seconds. Well, there's a table uh, 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 relay that I've seen. I'm like, it's kind of touchy. It's essentially, you know, I guess I do this remotely with people. You kind of reset. I want to do it twice, but you kind of set it to a test position, turn on the machine, turn it off, set it back to the position, turn it on, and it's fine. So, um, yeah, I mean, that was definitely one of the, the, the very important things for our diagnostics customers who are using these things that are not there. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of things to look here. We have our three drops, and here is our post drops. We can see, again, there's this kind of condensation happening. I, mean, I think there's probably the AMSO that lands, and it's like kind of evaporating, and it condenses right around because the evaporation causes the cooling on the side surface right there, so it's a little bit more evaporation. Um, so you see here your three labels. You see all the labels here. Um, maybe there's some funny behavior here from the second label. So here that we saw having a down just the right way, just uh, those are all features. So again, okay, so you have all this information. You can go back, it's depending on how conservative you want to be. You can say they I don't know for sure that that was perfect, so I'll let's do it. Um, but I don't see anything wrong with the terms. So that all, and these all the other protections, you can see kind of the uh, you know, uh, talking about. So you have to start to get a little funky. This is the actor on that droplet. And so we cleaned it before we get this droplet. So, Back to some questions in the chat from an hour and 45 minutes ago. 
so the thing is that they want to work at least the full of language and I think and for the M track, we're going to continue with the track to make sure that we can continue with the track to make sure that we can continue with the track to make sure that we can continue with the track to make sure that we can continue with the track to make sure that we can continue with the track to make sure that we can continue with the track to make sure that we can continue with the track to make so what you can do, I don't know any good so just that you have to do it the power just the volume that they switch to like the other set ship so we also get so we have to do the So make sure you don't put your sample in there, depending on your desire. So we're going to need to do five of the doubles, and we're going to need to do that, and also one of the doubles and seven. So yeah, I think very much at all. Preload this plate with two microliters, uh, put one percent leak in. We do 0.05% per cent there, yeah. Um, so, uh, and essentially, that just gives us a volume at the bottom, which is the volume that I'm saying. I think that might be pretty important, but all at the same time, for real, it's a little bit more than three or four plates. I found these low binding plates that you want to finish with one use. So, we have the options. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So because there are so many, uh, so many wells, so many of these kind of cell clusters, we need to pick up the two different plates, one of the three that make more individual uh, samples. So we can pick up, uh, I believe the first two slides go to one plate, the second two slides go to a different plate. One, essentially we just have a position here that's essentially located for each of those wells. Just going to check that we all have the right stuff. Okay. 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 Make sure you guys have a good system but in the beginning. We have that system, no, we can shoot it up, and that's what we can see. Yeah, it's good, you know, we saw it. There ends up being <laughs> like hundreds of drone folders and stuff. Yeah, definitely. There's all the, all the data is there, you just have to find it. Yeah. <laughs> and you can name it uh, whatever you want. So, like, I like that. Uh, make sure it's something that it is uh, distinguishable. Like, oh, I'll remember this one. And so I suppose we can take turns looking at this because pickup is pretty cool. Um, looking at it, rotate and everything, and you see the uptake percent of ACN and water mixed together, and then it was going to go into it, um, which kind of plays off the plate. So it is pretty cool. Yeah, so we start off by aspirating, I think it's five or six micrometers out of here. We then go and ask for eight, yeah. 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 eight 12 micrometers of the 50 50 is even that trial of water. Um, and then you move to the surface of the slide, and we're printing for about 600 microns above the surface. We move down 500 microns, now we're about 100 microns from the surface. We flush out three or four microliters. We kind of dance around to make sure that it spreads. I don't think it's really actually an important step in order to build the flex DIA. But the larger the flex is, it's very important to make sure that we incorporate all of the little droplets into the larger droplets. Um, we then uh, aspirate up uh, partial partial volume. We flush out again the partial volume. I think it's two microliters. You can see it here. We flush. We now do our dance. We do a partial aspiration. We flush again. We have a three second incubation, five second incubation. Then we're going to aspirate slightly more than we put down. We put down three microliters. We ask for five microliters. And so we have that as a plug in the nozzle that is the eight microliters of. Uh, uh, mostly just going to be using natural water, about a few microliters as this your specified sample oils. We then move over to the well plate, flush out more than that plug, uh, and not enough to get the kind of system liquid as well, and then move back in wash. So I feel really like it is kind of cool to watch. You can see it. Watch the things, and then look for that thing. That's my but it's pretty cool. What's that thing? Four years ago, Andrew was pipetting every sample off of the slide surface one at a time, swap, swapping the pipette sample each time to my position. And so the day before SCP, I flew in Red Eye on Saturday. We went to some, you know, greasy little breakfast joint at some crazy food on a Sunday morning. Went into the lab and then automated this whole pickup process on the first time. And, um, again, because the, the flexibility of the machine, and you guys just uh, essentially put this little bit of that foundation and then automated the pickup of this higher complexity. Yeah. Uh, and again, we're happy to help you do that, but you have the flexibility to do it on your own. So, and more. 
Yes, we've got we've got a couple of types of documents. We have a one like a full protocol that's split up into three sections. The third section is getting started, and definitely he's gonna buy it for them all the engines and some hard measure uh, and accessories for that and see that all that stuff. Uh, some suggestions on um uh, so I'll say that for us, I'll that. And then we've got our the protocol, which actually takes you through yeah, the whole process um, here. And then we've got a data uh, acquisition and interpretation section, kind of a basic rundown. Uh, today we have uh, plus more details about how you set a ball by your, your instruments um, to make sure kind of what you can expect that I'm saying a little more so more that's that is giving you this kind of a signal from you know your standards. Um and then we got these quick reference guides which essentially it's just it's just supposed to be kind of a landing guide but that might actually be a checkbox and then you go on and it says you know this is very quick read of it. So a lot of it's done thing with messages on the screen and um but, but yeah, essentially the goal is that this becomes you know, this kind of very complex, but you set the process becomes this issue because of the other issue that you know I'm saying about the machine. I would think that you know the machine um also so each one, each one gets the electron. Each one gets a cell. Every cell, each one gets a person. This one is labeled zero, D4, D8. And then we the D8 be the whole one. And then we come back and pull them all together. So every reaction has happened. I was like, why not? Why not? Why not? Only after we come back. And that's it. That becomes the screen version. Yeah. That's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. That's One of the guys on the people to go to the other guy. One of the guys that's on the cell phone, and the other guy's 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 on the cell yeah, so I mean, um, that's what we So I mentioned the stones and gravel to the next stage. So essentially, this is what makes it the sound one. It's a and the last one, it's a particularly handy way to have a side of the deck. We had uh, an extending plate on it, so that now the nozzles can be inserted on the plates and the relationship of the current space. So you can imagine having a of multiple of those robots, so I can only move that on the plane track, and it's all in the plane track. And you know, that's what I meant to say. I mean, are based on the system. So, you can know, basically, you can talk to these people and do that. Um, and what they see means they kind of look at them as well. And it's how they stay on your side. And so, I'm not going to do it. But you got it, but it's I'm going back to you. Yeah. 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 I think it's like, you guys see those labels where they were uh, infrared 
activated as their uh, essentially their organizational efficiency was increased a lot. And then we were I think something like it. I think that's the matrix that's in the yeah, for me, it was like, yeah, I mean, it don't make sense not to fight by here if we do the Nathana Center, right? It's the trip is so hard to manage for me. yeah I think it's also a good timing to yeah, yeah. Uh, it's make sure that it's a great I heard it was and then, um, there were so many things that were like, so we did the most. Ah, yeah, I just love it. So, I got it together, but there were things I got it together. But I got it together. 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 I got it so like also uh, and they're having the people already yeah. you know this <laughs> no, I, I don't think it needs to be dropped with this stuff for a while. I need to it's okay you know, for their business, right? They can't sign that. Please that that's it, like a few hundred and then and then expect people to buy the next one and they would probably be like three four years and I'll do something here. yeah, I think the name is like that because we have some kind of uh, that's so yeah. 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 yeah, that's probably all yeah. 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 everybody knows it's pretty much like that. Yeah, like the triple swap, those are all the above. I mean, you get it. 
Well, I'm not a bit of a bit a bit of 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 a bit I am the fan of Chef Dorian. <laughs> Some people are showing like the uh, pictures with like a flight of Shrek and the Yeah, I'm also, is it? Uh, so, so, I think it's a good thing. But uh, um, I'm also a little bit of a big fan of this. Uh, so, I mean, I think it's generally you have a lot of you know that you have like a little bit of hair. Yeah, but you want to know if you can sell the Yeah, you do have to get your own that these, uh, get the problem. No, I think you know, it's a problem. 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 It's a probl
What we do is just like in buffer on themselves. So we have a little bit of 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 a little bit Nanogram per micro two, like ten nanograms per micro two. Uh, you can do the same, but we have a little cheaper the thing that are meant to transfer all the the of so, so what do you like to Yeah, yeah. So it's the same principle as, as with the base. It's just that it has a very conical shape, so you can maintain the you know your support Yeah, it's like it's called a road that you can cheap. It's not a road that you can cheap. So you have to use the system that you can cheap. So that is the other bit, but it's natural, so you have to do this first. That we use it when, for example, uh, we have the specific side tag that you can't really solve. Uh, and that's actually why we use the setup uh, method because we are collaborating with people that do it. And we will see that we can do it. Like, that's the thing we are doing. We should have an experiment. And we have to say, 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 so what well, actually you so can I so what is this so what they do is they, they go by themselves with the records go like that uh, they even have uh, some room in the mouse insert you know like they pick it up and then they uh insert it yeah. Yeah. Uh, so in case uh, like to my furniture of like the and then they come with the chip uh, with their pipettes and they insert uh, the pipette and then they the cell the and then you get the light uh, I don't want to bring well. Yeah, because uh, I mean, the problem is that you can do very essential, but the area of the is very essential. So they can make a half of my money for us about the expansion of these plans. Then you integrate the 37 degrees for like at least two hours, and then uh, you just wash it out, acidify like on top, wash it out, and come on top of the Yeah. So you have like two different lines in pressure. You uh, put the water so that it doesn't uh, get dry, uh, and put the water in Just to cover the face. Because if you have to try it, it, it gets up in the tip and dilutes your, uh, your sample. So you want to just cover the paint so that it gets uh, not dry. Then you place it at 37 until it's like this. Like then we seem to go down like not in the cross section, create like this. Should we have a sample of the other So what you do after is you add, uh, add uh, 30 by 40 of equal one percent of base on top, uh, spin down at 800 uh, uh, G, and then you do your normal like, like rinse again with equal one percent of base, and then uh, but then you will use because the two arms the the question you have there is that you do a lot of things if you want to do that you don't see it by the you would have to have a kind of short term, so uh, we could, for example, try it with the... Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, we will say that. It works to an extent, but it's still better with that one. Because the problem is you can't 
I mean, it works without giving up, but I guess it's probably not good for the system. I haven't done for a while on that. Yes, I can't answer all the facts. I don't know what the hell is going on. I think it's always done with that. But that's what I'm saying. That's also the question of the facts of the country. You don't know whatever you do with the actual works because it's so transitory, yeah, like, numbers. But then you should always like compare to like the state of the art, which I at that point is the seller uh, one. And then you compare like in terms of the range of books, so who know the numbers are right here in this. Yeah. Yeah. Then they have a, a ton of budget. Then you need to be creative, right? But you can make it work. It's just that, of course, you won't have the best. Yeah. 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 Thank you. 
I'm working with Ken Sala. I'm working with Ken Sala. We have a chance to submit the preprint for CD. So you can have a look at it. So I don't like a and they also just sort of look like in the course and then, like for virtual direction or something, we did the definition and some sort of things to make sure you still have like one different, but you have to And they get control of like the shit is going to be We understand how that's what they get at fish Total, you come to them there, they will be seen after the So I was actually the DIA book. Yes. So, but yeah, so we the the matching with the the ball there between the two is very different. And it's been like yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to have a question. Maybe one month or two, it's going to be done. Like, do you need to be done? But the thing is, 
you can do it the same way that maybe you can set up to make well they set up like this for this machine learning, you know, to kind of uh you can have that you have that you have that you that you have 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 that you so right now, uh, so I haven't seen the bot there, but uh, I think it was looking like got this big uh, yeah. Yeah. And if you look, I went roughly manually because of the part of the annual. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You can pretty much see like there is some four or five months buffers, the buffer side that are only in cells and you may know it's going on. I don't know if you want to speak to your board, but I think about it. I don't know if you want to speak to your board, but I think about it. I don't know if you want to speak to your board, but I think about it.